Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander viewers are warned that the following program may contain images and voices of deceased persons. Miff Warhurst from Spicks and Specks and Triple J. Tonight, the story of a musician whose life reads like something from a Tim Winton novel. As lead singer of the successful ladies band Goanna, Shane Howard wrote some of Australia's seminal rock songs. Since then, he's experienced both wonderful highs and difficult lows with a family saga that stretches over decades and across the continent. This is his story. <laughs> I don't know a world without music. I don't know what life's like without music. It just was always there. All new yeah. All new I was a middle child, so there were older brothers and sisters, and you just slotted into that. I guess, you know, seeing at Mass and seeing at church was the first sort of contact with that. And Mum would play the organ, of course. So um, there was a sense of the religious aspect of your life, but there was also that great sense of kicking up your heels as well. And He's just a general legend of Australian music, one of the great singer-songwriters that this country has ever produced. Would you please welcome Shane Howard. I had some time in this old town Hung around here much too long I got no secrets left to hide This time I headed south with the great divide Success is a wild horse and you've got to ride it bareback and there's no reins and I, I think there are very few people in the world at, who can handle fame or success um, at any age, particularly um, when you're young. And the winner is Solid Rock, the Goanna Band. It's a deceptive thing, it's a powerful thing, and um, you just gotta hang on and try and stay on, and very few people can. When I look into Shane's eyes, I see the wisdom of a hundred-year-old man, someone who's seen and heard stories from parts of Australia that most of us will never hear or see in our lifetime. Someone who's seen an incredible amount of hardship, uh, who's seen great happiness, who's seen the absolute essence of culture coming from Australia and Ireland and in all of his travels. And yet when I look in his eyes, I also see the innocence and absolute passion of an 18-year-old long-haired boy who went, I now know what it's all about and I'm going to tell Australia all about it. And I also see the contented eyes of a 50-year-old man who is loved and loves others and he's living. He's really living every day. It wasn't the life I set out to have, but it has been an extraordinary life. A solid rock changed my life for better and for worse. It brought with it incredible pressures and responsibilities. Um, I've tried to honour the promise of that. I'm Shane's sister and I was in Goanna with Shane. We were known as the Von Trapp family of the Western District because we played and sang at everyone's weddings, parties, kitchen teas, celebrations, mum on piano and all of us singing, you know, Mary Poppins song, Sound of Music, hence the name Von Trapp's The Western District. 
and I just fell in love with the notion of a bohemian life, you know, play music. We couldn't wait to get out of Warrnambool, so once high school was done, I went to Melbourne, went to Monash, did Social Enlightenment 101. We started putting a band together with some of the local guys who I was going to uni with, and that was where Goanna emerged, and then it kind of went through a few incarnations and plenty of struggle and strife. I'd long wanted to do a pilgrimage to Uluru, so the band all put in, and it's a big open space, big open country. It was my first real experience with that. And there's also, I think, that sense that in a big landscape, you can think big thoughts. I set up my camp that night and cooked something up and I was just sitting there playing guitar. And I just felt a great wave of sadness, I guess at that point, hit me. I cried, I cried for probably 10 or 15 minutes and I don't know why, I don't really know why. Yeah, the next day I got up and I went to see the local Aboriginal community and asked permission and stuff to be there. And it was the first time I really felt a sense of being welcomed into an Aboriginal landscape. And that's a very, a very empowering feeling and a beautiful feeling to know that you're walking on that country in the right way. I went from there to Alice Springs and I saw the grog, the violence, the decimation that colonialism had brought. And after that very transforming experience at Uluru, I got really angry then. The culture of forgetfulness in Australia about Aboriginal people hit me in the face and I couldn't be silent about it. You can't unknow what you know. The dichotomy of those two experiences led me to write Solid Rock. Racial discrimination was really being challenged in America. It was confronting things that then go Australia is no different. It's slightly different because they're Indigenous people, but there was a, an incredibly racist basis to the whole country. Out here, nothing changes, not in a hurry anyway. I can remember playing the song to various people, and people who'd been in the record industry and very successful, a lot of them would say to me, are you mad? This will never get played. You're dreaming. This is hippie bullshit. Somewhere, someone like because Top 40 Radio is not going to play a song that, 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 that says, White Australia, you, 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 you have participated in genocide. It was a complete smash hit in this country from the day it was released. When we heard of these white fellas singing a song about Uluru, we thought, yeah, we better go and meet these fellas, you know, check them out. Been best friends ever since. I think he saw that he could maybe play a role there that um, he didn't see many other people doing, that was taking up a challenge to say that, look, you know, we're, as white fellas, you know, we need to do something. The greatest privilege and the greatest pleasure for us was that a song like Solid Rock saying what it did say could enjoy the commercial success that it did. And if that can make some small contribution to a greater understanding of the Aborigine people of this country, a living culture. Tasmania, the hardest heart would understand. Shane found the... the the reality of rock stardom to be a pretty difficult one to handle. So let the breakers fall, let the wild and free, the wilderness should be strong and free. The 
Americans want us to drop everything we're doing and come to America. You're going to be bigger than men at work. On the other hand, you're out there touring around Australia, meeting Aboriginal people and dealing with this absolutely gritty reality. So it's stretching your head. Everyone's bought the record, or it's hugely successful commercially, but people don't really want to know the ugly underbelly of what that's saying. So it was a very lonely time too. It was a very um, confronting and lonely time. We spent a lot of money recording the second record. And the second, the second record didn't sell nearly as well as it should have. He went out and toured that album all over Australia and toured and toured and toured. We reached a point where there were no more places left to play. It wasn't working. We were losing about $7,000 a week. You've got a lot of people's lives and their incomes at stake. Things had basically turned to crap at that stage. That put a, a huge pressure on Shane and his family. He was not in good shape because he was physically, mentally a beaten man. I had four children, huge responsibilities, a huge debt and no way of really making a living. At a personal level, yeah, I knew we were in trouble. I mean, our relationship was in trouble. We did a show in Sydney that night and Shane didn't turn up at the gig. I was worried about him at that time. I knew that things weren't working. We talked about that. But um, he had to make a lonely decision. At about um, four in the morning, I packed my bags and I knew I'd made that decision that night that it was over and I had to go. I had to make provisions that my family would be okay and I did that to the best of my ability and then I left. Not an easy thing to walk away from your wife and four kids and you know you're going to carry the stigma for that too. No one loved their wife and children more profoundly, more deeply than Shane Howard. No one I've ever met loved their wife and children more. I wanted to get to Uluru to the hand back of uh, Uluru to the traditional owners. A lot of the Aboriginal people who were very close friends were going to be there. So I felt there was a sense of support there. I mean, I was probably in the midst of a, a breakdown. I was completely and utterly lost and fairly low self-esteem at this point. And this beautiful love was coming back from Aboriginal Australia. And in many ways, it really... Um, that was the safety net that caught me when white Australia couldn't. Um, for which I'm eternally grateful. You know, you go from idealism to rock bottom, and I think that's what happened. And I think he felt really rejected by, you know, white people, you know, the white fellas. And yeah, it was the black fellas, it was Aboriginal people who said, look, hey brother, don't worry about it, you know, we've been there for a long time, you know, join us. <laughs> and uh, it, it doesn't matter what you are, we don't care if, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, not selling gold records every day of the week. After all that, I ended up then in North Queensland, living with a lady called Lynn, and basically adopted a very alternative lifestyle. It was pretty strange. What was this guy who'd done solid rock and, you know, been in the Goanna band doing in the Gulf of Carpentaria? Living in a caravan, well, that was affordable housing at the time. 
he looked like a man who was lost completely. Like, it doesn't matter if I'll live or die. Didn't have two cents to rub together. He didn't want to write. He didn't want to, you know, be a musician anymore. He didn't even know what his place in the world was. He had that, you know, sense of, yeah, absolute despair, utter despair. They were hard years. They were really hard years. I mean, it's not an easy thing to be distanced from your kids. I ended up spending four years out in the Gulf of Carpentaria. I then had a daughter, uh, Myra, who was born in Coranda. When Myra was born in 88, uh, she represented an enormous amount about the core of my being. That's right. There you go. That's reasonably set. Um... I'm still going back and forward, making records or trying to make records. Extraordinary thing happened. There was an Irish singer, Mary Black, who was coming out to Australia to do a tour. Did I want to do the opening spot? On that tour, I sang a song called Flesh and Blood. It was basically about the struggle I was feeling with my kids. picked up on that song and she loved it and she went back to Ireland. And Shane was unaware of the fact that Mary Black recorded Flesh and Blood and released the song and while Shane was doing it pretty tough up north, you know, he gets a call to say that Flesh and Blood is a huge hit in Ireland. Which completely out of the blue, for the first time Shane has now got a song of his overseas doing remarkably well so that after the journey that Shane had been on was manna from heaven I would say something like it saved his life that's what I would say on you Mary Shane is forever thanking me for doing his songs and thanks for keeping me alive through the hard years and putting my kids through school too. And I say to him, but it's a circular thing. I mean, your songs are what's kept me going too. We had a big, big concert in, in the Point Theatre in Dublin. I brought him up on stage and he couldn't believe it because everybody, the whole 4,000, were all there singing every word of the song with him. And that, I think, was a very moving moment for him. Mary then went on to record more and more of my songs. She restored my self-esteem. She empowered me financially. She gave me an audience in Ireland. She made people in Australia pay attention again. And then another extraordinary thing happened and I got another phone call around about the same time, not long after that, from my first wife, Claire, she rang out of the blue and said I'd been diagnosed with breast cancer. She asked me if I would come back to Warrnambool. Claire also said, I realise that they're your children too and you're their dad and, um, <clears throat> you know, they need you as well. I was then faced with possibly one of the most difficult moral choices I've had to make in my life. Do I leave another wife and another child? I didn't want to end up in a similar situation with Myra to what had happened with the other children and ending up distanced and estranged. At both ends you're torn by um, a deep love of your children, so... Um, and they're complications of your own doing too, you know. One of the hardest things I ever did was to drive out of Karamba and leave a child, another child behind, leave Myra behind. Well, I think that having to leave Myra up there with Lynn, it probably just about killed him, just about did him in. 
I don't think the kids or Shane or anyone involved thought that Claire would die. And so when she started to deteriorate and, and got worse and then died, it tore the kids to pieces. Any chance of them actually sort of finding solace with their dad, who they were only just starting to have a normalised relationship with, was fairly remote. And so, understandably, they pulled away. And then I found myself uh, here in the Monastery of Song in Kalani, which is just out of Warrnambool. And I bought this little place. And I, I knew deeply that with my kids, I had to create a spiritual home. And that was for all my kids. That was for the four older ones and for Myra. I would often see him walking the sand dunes here in Kalani. I'd say he had what you would call a solitary life. Shane not having his children in his life seemed like a, a black hole for him. And he felt that uh, his only choice was to wait and see what happened. I went through another period of darkness. There was a time where I couldn't see Myra. There was a time where the uh, the kids, we kind of became distanced again. In a way, I think there may have been a degree of resentment to the fact that, you know, Mum died, I didn't. Mum, I did it. I was the girl next door, literally. Oh, you did it. Oh. <laughs> I thought it was a bit of a spunk. I can only speak for myself, but I fell madly in love and, and it all sort of steamrolled from there very quickly. Everyone says, I don't want to be wedding. Well, the problem is, when it's your daughter's wedding, you can't be in the band. I said to her, you know, um, you're so much younger than me, don't get involved. <laughs> My life is too complicated, don't get involved. Yeah, you're right. Teresa was a single mum, she had a young daughter. I'm doing the big one. You do the little one? I'd travelled around, I was still a bit footloose and fancy free, but I was ready to try and make a home. And he was the guy I wanted to make the home with. <laughs> Shane and I have two children together, Patrick and Neve, and I have an older daughter, Ruby, who's 11. Yay! Hi. The times when I've seen Shane most happiest is when he's with his kids. He's completely unguarded and he loses any sense of public persona. Yes! <laughs> I understood that Shane had felt like he made mistakes in his life and the cost, the price that he paid for that was that he had lost contact with his children. And I knew really clearly that it was important for him to make contact with his kids again. <laughs> She's reached out to all my kids, to all their mothers, to their extended families and helped to create, to turn my little house into a spiritual home. It was Teresa that completed that picture for me. Oh. Yeah, well these days my relationship with the four eldest kids is, uh, is a joyful one. My career is one thing, but my real task is to be a great dad. I think I'm getting there. Now, um, the love that exists between the older ones and the younger ones, you know, they are a family. They're a family unit. And when I'm long gone, they'll be a force. So where's this going to go? In the ceremony, after the ceremony? Probably in the wedding ceremony. OK. Around the readings time. The reason we're here today is to get a few songs sorted for my eldest daughter Jessie's wedding, which is coming up in about four weeks' time. So I just running through that with Jess and my eldest son. Emotional. What an emotional wreck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would rather have your love than all the wonders of the world. Yes, sir. 
sort of yeah, D minor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They saw success that I went through. They saw the damage that it can wreak. They don't really want to talk about that sort of stuff. Yeah, cool. Yeah, Shane's life has been very troubled at times, and he's got a, a big, big heart, and, and the problem with Shane is he never wants to hurt anybody. But I think the, probably the person who's been hurt most was him in the end. Jeez. I don't want... He's turned his life around, which I think a lot of people might have been in, in despair, might have gone a different road. And uh, it's so great to see him so happy now. And... Uh, and settled and, and, and his family all around him and and there's a lot there's been a lot of forgiveness and and loads of love and I think that's what's most important. I still kept contact with Myra, travelled up there, you know, at least twice a year, or she would come down here. Happy They say life starts at 40, but for me, maybe it's 50. This is a, a beautiful time of life, a time of happiness, of peace, of even contentment. My life is a circle now, you know. If it took this long to get to the good stuff, well, that's okay.